everybody to the annual HP Rockwood lecture, which is the a major uh, lecture for us. Uh, it's an annual lecture. Uh, the Institute for Neural Computation is now over 30 years old, and uh, this annual lecture goes back to the founding of the Institute for Neural Computation. Now, uh, this, this was a time when neural networks were really hot. This is before some people were born here. Uh, but, but it was really exciting. We, we had uh, uh, invented these learning algorithms so we could train these by Teddy standards, tiny networks. You heard about GDPT2 with you know, hundreds of billions of connections. Well, a large network back in, in the 90s was maybe 10,000 connections. Right, one layer of opinions. That's all changed. And the Rockwood lecture has a special history. So Paul Rockwood was an undergraduate here at UCSD in computer science. And he had a, a real vision that it should be possible to write an AI program that could translate between languages which as you know, is a very, very difficult problem, especially using computers back then that had less computing power than your watch, right? <laughs> and um, just to show you how difficult it is, uh, there was competitions, you know, people were writing programs and you know, the, the, the idea was that, you know, we, we know something about linguistics, we should be able to figure out how to uh, be able to go back and forth. And so here's the test, you test, you give it a sentence in English, Translate it to Russian and then translate it back from Russian to English. Okay, that was the test. So here's an example of the performance of those programs at that time. This is in the 80s. Here's the sentence The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, everybody understands what that means, don't you? You don't? Okay, you know, if, 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 you know, there, there's a cultural thing here. <laughs> I'll explain it to you later. But in any case, so you know, they 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 went into Russian and came back, and here's what came back: the wine is good, but the meat is rotten. <laughs> Which I suppose is one variant, you know, uh, you know, in in, one, in some culture. But it shows how difficult the problem was. Now, the tragedy is that he was a rock climber and he fell and died in, in, in an accident. And his parents uh, wanted to commemorate his, their son. And so uh, we were the ones that uh, were carrying on in his tradition. Now, the, what's remarkable now over the last 10 years is that his vision has actually come to pass in ways that I could never have imagined back in the 80s or 90s, because what we didn't know back then, we, we, we showed that we could generalize, we showed that uh, it could solve less difficult problems like uh, NetTalk, which is something I worked on, which was text to speech. You can give it a bunch of words in a sentence and it would pronounce it in a way you could understand it, which at the time was really re remarkable for such a tiny network. It could generalize, the rules, but also the exceptions, which makes English particularly difficult, as you know, as a second language. Or maybe it's your first, is it first language? Okay. <laughs> so that's, uh, English is really an, ex is an exception in terms of it's the difficulty for non-native speakers to learn how to speak it because of all the exceptional uh, words and sounds. Okay, so what happened over the last, just actually the, less than 10 years was networks now, large scale, huge networks. We didn't know that they would, how they would scale. We now know that they scale beautifully. They scale and the bigger they are, the more capabilities they have. So about five years ago, there were recurrent neural networks with feedback connections that could do sequences of inputs and produce sequences of outputs. And it was doing a really pretty good job with translation between pairs of languages. Very, that was a real breakthrough. And, and now it became practical. People are actually using it now. But even more amazing, just three years ago, uh, these uh, pre trained networks, GPT 2 and uh, 3, the successor, and Lambda at Google, 
uh, called large language models. They're called foundation models because they're pre-trained. You just have to train them once and then they can be, they can now do many tasks. And, and for example, uh, you can give it that phrase that I, I mentioned earlier and it, it could explain it for you. It can tell you what it means, the semantics. And it will tell you this in English, syntactically correct English. And it was trained, actually, self-supervised. It was trained to predict the next word in the sentence. Huge text. I mean, you know, we're talking about the, it, it would eat Wikipedia for a snack. <laughs> and in fact, it would eat computer programs. So these, these, these large language models now can write properly you can, in English. You can say, write a screensaver that does, looks like this and has this, and you press the button and, and you'll write the program in HTML and it will give it to you. And it's amazing how versatile it is. And you can, you can not only ask it uh, what the meaning is of a phrase, you can actually say, I, uh, you, could you write a, sh a short story where that's the last line in the short story, that phrase. You press the button, you wait for a few seconds, and here comes the short story. And then you can say, well, write the short story in the style of Hemingway. Press the button, out comes another short story in the style of Hemingway. That, that is astonishing. It's, it's causing a huge controversy. There are some out there who say, well, you know, that's they, uh, these net language models don't know what, they don't understand what they're saying, right? They're, they're just parrots. You know, okay, well, the really smart parent. <laughs> um, and, and that they're not intelligent. And, and, and so there are other people on the other side who say that, look, they seem to have not, not just ability to give you facts and, and explain things, but they can also, they have a theory of mind. You can give them a story and then they can uh, tell you what people were thinking, you know, in terms of the relationships and so forth. So that's a hallmark of, of not just intelligence, but a certain degree of social consciousness, right? And uh, and like, like I say, they're, they're very versatile. So it, you just have to give it an example or prime it. And it can do many, many, many different language tasks. And, that, that, and again, that's something, the hallmark of humans, that we can do these things. So it's, it's it, you know, it's, it's really, for me, a, a really uh, uh, unexpected and still mysterious. We don't understand how they work. But as these, as the, and by the way, when we're getting up to hundreds of billions of neurons, that's about the number of synapses under a square centimeter of cortex, right? So it's getting up there in terms of, uh, still not up to human standards, there's still you know, a thousand square centimeters of cortex, but, uh, but it's, it's reached the point now where it can do a lot of things that we thought he, only humans could do, right? We now have another fellow AI system that we can talk to. Right, we didn't have that. Uh, there aren't any animals that can talk to, to us in English or Russian or any other language. Okay, well, uh, that, that's the background for this lecture. And I'm really pleased now that we have a, a, a new Rockwood lecture and Scott McCabe is going to, who's the director of the uh, computational, Schwartz Computational, uh, neuroscience center here at the INC. I will introduce the speaker. Thank you, Terry. Well, it's my really great pleasure to introduce Jonathan Wolpaw uh, of Albany, New York. I first met him in 2000, I believe, at the one of the series of meetings on brain computer interfaces that he organized. Those meetings are now worldwide symposiums put on by a BCI society. Uh, I, I don't think there's much uh, more validation for a pioneer in a new field than to have a, uh, a worldwide society uh, growing in, uh, in uh, interest and uh, outreach to, to, to uh, realize the the real interest and impact of the vision that propelled it. Jonathan uh, Wopaz, a board-certified neurologist, and 
He's long had two research groups operating on different floors of the building originally, and uh, one to study uh, synaptic plastic or, or uh, neuroplasticity in the spinal column with the eventual goal of uh, restoring function for uh, spinal injuries. And the second, the brain computer interface group uh, with the first clinical goal of achieving communication with so-called locked in patients uh, who through uh, ALS or brainstem stroke have lost all ability to communicate while retaining consciousness of their environment and their, uh, and their thoughts and needs. And in, uh, to relieve those individuals of that torturous uh, condition um, was the, has been the clinical goal of, of his BCI group. Uh, as I say, the BCI work has blossomed continually over 30 years. And, uh, and now I see uh, references in the literature to uh, recovery from spinal cord injury through miraculous new research that I'll hear, I'm sure we'll hear about. So Jonathan. <laughs> Well, th thank you. Thank you, Scott. It was great to receive Scott's invitation. I've known Scott, as he said, for over 20 years at least. He's been one of the uh, stalwarts of the BCI field and one of the reasons why it's been really enjoyable and very collegial to, to be part of that field. So um, he talked about me having two separate interests, and they really were very separate for a long time. And they've gradually grown together so that they're not, I can no longer see any difference between them. And that'll sort of be the underlying part theme of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about how brain computer interfaces create. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, this uh, thing is, with Zoom, I think, is another microphone. Is there... Should I use the other? Uh... No, the direction is a microphone. Yeah, I think so. Okay, let me know because I can use the other one. Okay. Well, maybe a little higher, just higher power. <laughs> Is that better? Oh, okay. Okay, so I'll be talking about brain computer interfaces create synthetic hexers. And in getting into this, um, I really want to start with my longtime colleague. Not going forward. Okay. Yes, my longtime colleague, Dr. Dennis McFarlane, who I think uh, quite a few people here knew. We unfortunately lost him several years ago. Dennis was a physiological psychologist, and also a really good applied mathematician and statistician. We worked together for about 35 years. Um, quite effectively, he was at least as responsible as I for the uh, achievements of the Wadsworth BCI group. Um, Dennis and I took a while to learn how to work together because it turns out we thought completely differently. Um, it took us a while to appreciate each other, but we found out and eventually we found that despite our different approaches, we always wound up on big things thinking absolutely the same thing. And one thing that we were very sure about was that brain computer interfaces don't read minds. That's not what they do. The public and the press like to hear about that, and that's fine if they want to believe that, but that's not basically what BCIs do. What BCIs do, what a brain computer interface is, is that the CNS acquires and produces the, norm, the healthy normal CNS in normal life 
acquires and produces adaptive behaviors or skills. All its natural skills are produced by muscles. What a BCI does is to convert central nervous system activity into non-muscular skills that replace, restore, enhance, supplement, improve, or emulate natural skills. So this is a figure from our um, Oxford BCI text of about uh, now 10, 10 years ago. Um, and it shows five applications, replacing, restore, enhance, supplement, and improve a BCIs. But actually it's now out of date and we're, uh, Dean Krasinski and I are in the process of doing the second edition and we'll be adding a sixth, which is emulate. And at, near the end of this talk, I'll be talking about a BCI application that emulates normal CNS function. So BCI use is a new kind of skill. And I think I can get rid of this, right? Maybe not. So it should be possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think more, try more. Yeah, more. Um, right. Oh. Yes, sir. Yeah. Say, uh, Hide, oh, yeah, and media controls. And yes, and this one, yes, there. Yeah, okay, okay, great. Okay, so BCI use is a new kind of skill. Like natural muscle based skills, muscle based behaviors. BCI-based skills are learned. They're acquired through practice. This, these are two examples of that. This is uh, data from Andy Schwartz's and Dawn Taylor's work now 20 years ago showing how a monkey gradually gains BCI control of movement of a cur cursor in three dimensions. And it shows the gradual reduction in the size of the target that the monkey was able to hit over days of practice. This is another example which is from a study um, in Jose Mian, by Jose Mian's group in two people with quadriplegia who learned to play a very simple BCI game that required uh, control of sensory motor rhythms over the central part of the head. They gradually acquired that control, as you can see, over, over a period of months. So, because BCIs create non-muscular skills, BCI research and development can benefit from recent advances in understanding how natural skills are acquired and maintained through life. This is extremely relevant. And I'm gonna go through here something of what will appear to be a digression, but as you will see, it's very essential because if we're gonna be able to, to do very effective research and development of brain computer interfaces, we need to understand how skills are acquired, how they're maintained through our life. And in the past 50 years, that our understanding of that has really been revolutionized. It's been revolutionized by prim primarily two major advances. The first advance is that over the past 50 years, the hardwired central nervous system of 1970 has gradually become the ubiquitously plastic central nervous system of today, in which change is the rule, not the exception. The CNS changes continually through life. There's neurogenesis, there's gene activation, neuronal properties change, synaptic properties change, long-term potentiation, long-term depression, glia change, dendrites change, hormones change, there's sprouting, even, even, there are even vascular changes. And during our lives, throughout our lives, all these various kinds of plasticity are somehow organized so that they produce and maintain the skills that we need to be effective in our lives. All this plasticity somehow gets coordinated and put together. So how does this happen? The second thing that we've learned, the second major advance, is that we've learned that the central nervous system substrate of a skill is a widely distributed substrate of neurons and synapses, that a widely distributed network of neurons and synapses that produces the skill and changes as needed to maintain the skill. So the skill isn't, isn't stored away in some software someplace and then downloaded 
into hardware to be produced. There is essentially almost no, little or no hardware in the central nervous system. It's all plastic. And the skill is distributed throughout. And that's been made clear by a variety of studies. This is a study by Badat's group now about seven years ago. What they looked at was the acquisition of the skill of a thing in a finger fre flexion frequency task, a finger flexion task, how, to, how the, the sequence of finger flexion became faster and faster. And as it became faster, there was, plas there was cha fMRI change that they could find in cortex and subcortically and in the cerebellum and in the spinal cord as well. The plasticity in all these regions made overlapping as well as independent contributions to the gaining of the skill. So this is a distributed network of neurons and synapses that produces this skill. This is another example that we've spent a great deal of time doing, working on over now over nearly 40 years. Um, this is the H reflex loop. Now the H reflex is the, and I realize there are people here from a variety of disciplines, so if I don't explain something fully, uh, let me know, or adequately let me know. So this is the basically the arc that's the knee jerk, we know is the knee jerk reflex. It's the simplest behavior of the mammalian central nervous system. It can, there's a, and here it's a, the H reflex, it's elicited electrically by a minimal stimulus given directly to the peripheral nerve, which can be the, by implanted electrodes in animals or by surface electrodes in humans. And this, this ex excitation goes in on the afferent and synapses monosynaptically and probably uh, oligosynaptically on the motor neuron and produces the H reflex. And here it is, the H reflex here occurring in rats about six or seven milliseconds after the stimulus. It's called H for Hoffman, who described it now over a century ago. This is an entirely spinal behavior. However, it is controlled by descending pathways from the brain. And because of this, monkeys, rats, mice, people can gradually acquire, change H reflex size when they're rewarded for doing so. So this is a very simple skill. And here you see it in rats over a period of days. This is primarily Shenyan Chen's work. The gradual increase with up conditioning and the gradual decrease with down conditioning. And this is in humans, this is Iko Thompson. These are people who, who perform 225 trials taking less than half an hour, three times a week over eight weeks. And you see the gradual increase with up conditioning and the gradual decrease with down conditioning. And the change is still present, largely still present months later. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time over 40 years, and this is primarily Shenyan Chen and Yu Wang, Jonathan Karp, Lu Chen, and Yi Chen at looking at the basis of this. What actually has changed? And what this is our current understanding of what happens to decrease the reflex. So here's the reflex right here, the H reflex. What happens is that the reward causes activity in the inferior olive, which produces plasticity in the cerebellum, which produces plasticity in sensory motor cortex, which changes corticospinal tract descending control, which leads to a immediate decrease in the size of the H reflex, a relatively modest immediate decrease. And then when that stays in effect over the weeks and months of practice, even humans are just performing half an hour of work three times a week, the, the effect is very similar to, an, to what happens in animals. There's a gradual change at many places in the spinal cord, including the motor neuron firing threshold, which is a particularly critical change, but I won't have time to talk about that today. And then that produces a much larger change in the H reflex. So this is the network responsible for this very simple change. Plasticity in the brain guides and it maintains plasticity in the spinal cord. So the CNS substrate of a skill is produced by a distributed, CNS, a skill is produced by a distributed substrate 
of neurons and synapses that produces a skill and changes as needed to maintain the skill. This was presaged by Bernstein in 1967 when he said behaviors are biodynamic structures that live and develop. I think probably, how many people here have heard of Bernstein? Okay, not too many. Okay, so this is a somewhat different kind of group than I usually speak to, but in certainly in a sensory motor group, everyone's heard of Nikolai Bernstein. So he was a- Yes, 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 yes. That, that's what will eventually happen. He was, he worked in, in the Soviet Union in the middle and the early, the early and middle 20th century. He had a tough time uh, basically for two reasons. The first, because he was a Jew. And second, because he didn't agree with um, Pavlov, which was a problem. Um, in any case, he worked very effectively and uh, he looked at behaviors and he took apart behaviors such as this. This was to help Soviet industry, which was, so everything really was political and his research was paid for because he was helping them, uh, helping Soviet industry. He looked at what happens when someone hits something with a hammer repeatedly. What actually occurs with that action? That's how he started studying behavior. So, and he said, behaviors are biodynamic structures that live and develop. So we're calling this substrate a hexer. And as you'll see, it has two unique properties. Now this name was defined from a Greek basis uh, with the help of the classical scholar, Adam Kamisar of Hebrew Union College. He, uh, after considerable work, he found a word used by the, originally by Aristotle and then by the Stoic philosophers, uh, hexus, and it really meant what we wanted. You know, these guys obviously didn't know <laughs> as much as we do now, but th this word was basically tailor-made for us. And it didn't matter that they did it 2,200 years ago. They might as well have done it last year. And from that, we got the name Hexer. Um, this was, for me, it was a very interesting experience working with a classical scholar because it's a, it's a very different uh, academic discipline. Um, the rules are different, their conventions are different, but also these guys mainly work on their own. They don't have to collaborate with anybody. So they're not really used to negotiating, to getting along with some. We sort of have to get along to some extent with other people. And, but uh, Adam really didn't need to do that. And there were several times in that several year, that many months that we remotely, this was during the pandemic, found this word where he basically was on the verge of throwing up his hands. And I was very scared that he was just gonna leave. Um, there was one point when uh, we were going between Hexon and Hexor, and I was sort of in favor of Hexon. And he said, you do that and I'm done. I'm out of here, you know? So, and he was right. I now realize that um, Hexor is much better because it, the OR meaning means it's an actor. It's an effector. It's something that's active. So we're calling this substrate a hexer. A hexer is a distributed network of neurons and synapses that produces a skill and changes as needed to maintain the key features of the skill. How is that different from a motor synergy? Okay, well, oh, okay. A motor synergy, I mean, uh, synergies are probably produced by hexers. And as you'll see, synergies are probably the product of hexers. But, but I'll get to that. And that's really, I mean, I'd like to talk about that a lot, but we probably don't have time, but at least right now, but these are hexers and they have two unique properties. First unique property of a hexer is that it changes continually to maintain the key features of its skill, the attributes that make the skill satisfactory. For example, locomotion, the attributes that make it satisfactory are the right-left symmetry, vertical posture, adequate balance, acceptable metabolic cost, et cetera. The EMG and the kinematic details may change, but the key features are maintained. A hexer is like a person with one purpose in life, to maintain its skill. Hexers are all doing this concurrently. The neuronal synaptic populations that they change overlap, and this is really critical. 
we really didn't think about this 50 years ago when we thought about what happens when learning occurs. We figured the learning occurs, it gets squirreled away somewhere and it gets downloaded into the hardware when it needs to be used. But when, learn anything, when a new skill is acquired, it's affecting neurons and synapses that are also being used by other skills. So there are really two things that have to happen. This skill has to be acquired and the other skills have to somehow adjust themselves so they're still satisfactory. Each, each hexer is continually responding to what others are doing. The second unique property of a hexer is that all the hexers are changing concurrently. Each is maintaining its skill because they share the CNS. The aggregate process is a negotiation. They negotiate the properties of the neurons and synapses they all use. They keep the central nervous system in a negotiated equilibrium that maintains all their skills. A new hexer expands the negotiation, the old hexers change in response. The details of old behaviors may change, the kinematics, the MG details, but the key features are maintained. The hexers achieve an expanded negotiated equilibrium. So this is the comparison between the old term of memory or engram and versus a hexer. Like memories, hexers are created by experience. There the similarity ends. Memories are passive, hexers are active. So the central nervous system uses memory to produce skill, memories to produce skills. They're accessed when they're needed. Hexers use the CNS to produce their skills. They change to maintain their skills. Their changes are a negotiation. The old term memory was suitable for the hardwired central nervous system of, of 1970. The new term hexer is suitable and is really needed to deal with a plastic central nervous system of today. And so here's the basic idea. This, this is a nervous system with a whole bunch of synaptic properties and, and neuronal properties that can change. Early in life, actually in utero and early in life, it acquires flexion withdrawal reflexes. These are learned by interactions with the environment, these, these change a certain set of neuronal and synaptic properties. A little later in life, we learn to walk, and that changes an overlapping set of properties. So these guys also have to change because these guys have changed, and they still need to produce adequate flexion withdrawal responses. So the flexion withdrawal and the walking hexers basically have to negotiate a solution. This one thing I want to point out here because it'll become, it'll be contrasted with the next hexer that I add. This is, these two hexers are basically symmetrical. Walking has to be symmetrical and flexion withdrawal might as well be symmetrical. So what happens, the changes that occur are probably pretty much the same on the, on the two sides of the nervous system. Later on, a person may learn a sport such as throwing the discus. Now, the, a lot of these sports are definitely not symmetrical. They're very asymmetrical. So that means that changes have to occur, asymmetrical changes in the cortex and subcortically, in the cerebellum, in the spinal cord, in the motor neurons, all the way down the ner central nervous system, there needs to be asymmetry. At the same time, flexion withdrawal and walking still have to be maintained. But and this is testable, these are testable predictions. They're being maintained differently after this negotiation occurs. Walking is still symmetrical, it looks fine, it may even be better, but it's not being done the same on the two sides and the flexion withdrawal responses aren't being done the same on the two sides. Now, I think most of us don't need our flexion withdrawal responses all the time so that this adaptation is not just occurring this negotiation is not just occurring when flexion withdrawal responses are occurring. It, the only, the, ex, the implication is inescapable that hexers are essentially negotiating all the time. This, is, this has to be going on all the time. So, I mean, I think this is part of the origin, at least, of the spontaneous activity that we see as noise in many of our now analyses. We're, and this again, these are testable predictions. In any case, these three hexers 
reach a state of negotiated equilibrium. A new hexer affects an old one. You can see a negotiation occurring here, a simple one. This is a rat walking along on a treadmill. You can see the right and left soleus burst. If we change the H reflex in one leg, the soleus H reflex, we make that burst. If we make the reflex bigger, the burst gets bigger. If we make it small, if we make it smaller, the burst gets smaller. If we make it bigger, the burst gets bigger. So we've changed the burst that's happening on the right side, but walking is not impaired. The animal continues to walk symmetrically. Walking does not become abnormal, and here's why. This is the animal walking along on the treadmill at joint angles, hip, knee, ankle. This is the reflex going down here. If this was all that, was hap that happened, the reflex got smaller in the soleus, this ankle angle would get smaller, and the hip would be lower on that side, and the animal would be tilted as it walked along, and the spine would be twisted. The hip heights would not be symmetrical. However, that isn't all that happens. The hip angle increases. As a result, the hip height is maintained. It's being maintained differently, but it's being maintained. The opposite happens with up conditioning. Again, the hip height is maintained. This bigger angle here gets balanced by a smaller angle there. The locomotor hexer has, a, has adjusted. They've negotiated a solution. This is essentially homeostatic plasticity. So I think these kinds of interactions have a role in explaining homeostatic plasticity as well. And this again is testable. One of, here's a piece of the, of the results of the negotiation. Um, there are probably many others. This is one piece that we know of. These are data from a rat that was trained up. The H reflex is bigger after going up and another rat's trained down. The H reflex is smaller after being trained down. This is the vastus lateralis, which is a muscle in the thigh. The vastus lateralis H reflex gets smaller when the soleus one gets bigger, and it tends to get bigger when the soleus gets smaller. We didn't ask this to happen. We didn't reward this in any way. It happened, and it is presumably part of the locomotor hexer's adjustment that keeps the key, its key features intact despite the new hexer. So, okay, so. How does this relate to BCIs? A hexer is a distributed network of neurons and synapses that produces a muscle-based skill and changes as needed to maintain the key features of the skill. A BCI creates a synthetic hexer. This is a term that was suggested by Sumner Norman, who's a, who's a colleague now at Caltech. A synthetic hexer is a distributed network of neurons and synapses that's combined with adaptive software. Network and software combine to produce a non-muscular skill and change as needed to maintain the key features of the skill. So I'll be talking about three applications of BCI-based synthetic hexers. One is to replace lost communication control. The second is to improve impaired muscle-based skills. The third is to emulate muscle-based skills for basic science. So, BCIs for communication and control have received a lot of attention. They, they were the first that drew many people, including us, into the BCI field. They drew a lot of attention in the press. They, they, the, in the reality, conventional techno technologies are much better for all but a very few of the most disabled people. BCIs, current BCIs are slow, and most of all, they're unreliable. This is the Grand Canyon, as I've described it, the Grand Canyon problem. There is no way, unless a person had a death wish, that they would ever control their body with a BCI on the edge of the Grand Canyon like this. They're not anywhere near as reliable as they would need to be to do. This is a 99% reliability. This is basically perfectly reliability you need. And they're nowhere near even 99% reliability. So at this point, they're they're very interesting, but they're not going to be used for really important major purposes in the near future. And this is the, I think, 
a big reason why. Clearly, better electrodes, better algorithms will help solve the problem, but engineering alone is not going to solve this problem. There's basic science that we need. Here is, I want to try to give you some idea of this. Normal hexers versus synthetic hexers. This is the negotiated equilibrium we talked about. This was the easy one between these two. This is the more difficult one, adding the asymmetric hexer. This is nowhere near the difficulty that would be encountered, that it's encountered here when a BCI hexer, a synthetic hexer, is added. This is a new, very strange entity that's much different from the others. And there are many reasons why it's going to be very difficult integrating this, an, an extremely difficult negotiation. This is normal CNS function summarized. You have all these parts of the nervous system which change themselves, which adapt to, to control muscles to produce our normal muscle-based skills. And these are all the hexers that have somehow worked out, negotiated a solution with all these areas that allows each one to produce its skill and maintain the key features of its skill. This is BCI system function. Again, you have all these areas, but here you're taking signals usually from the cortex. They're going through this BCI and they're controlling skills. So we're asking all these areas to change to produce cortical activity that can go to the BCI, which is also changing, which is going to produce these non-muscular skills produced by the BCI. This is what the BCI is asking to do. So what do we get when we combine these things? And that, that's a synthetic hexer. So what do we get when we combine that? We get reality. We get the normal hexers and the synthetic hexer. When I first did this slide, I looked at it and I said, wait, I can't show this. No, this is, this is a mess. This looks ridiculous. But that's the point of the slide. It is a mess. This is something, an enormous problem here. How do, we, how do we do this? How do we get this synthetic hexer integrated with the others so that it can produce its non-muscular skill satisfactorily? Enabling a synthetic hexer to reach a negotiated equilibrium with normal hexers that supports rapid and reliable, that's the big deal, the reliable part. BCI-based communication control is an enormously difficult problem. Here are just some ideas. I mean, they're not necessarily very good ideas, but there's some ideas for addressing this problem. First, the BCI needs to substitute for the many subcortical contributions. So here, the BCI really is taking over from everything below the cortex. And these areas are, and there, these areas are also able to interact normally with themselves. They're not able to interact directly with the BCI. So the BCI somehow is emulating or trying to replace all these areas. So that's one, poss one possible way of improving the problem. The BCI should use signals that reflect brain activity it's in, that's important in muscle-based skills. The BCI should receive detailed feedback on performance so that it itself can produce process control. It can produce the, the goal that's achieved, not just the, not, um, it, it should be able to produce the, basically the equivalent of the EMG and kinematics that achieve the goal. The BCI needs redundancy in its control options. BCI-based skills need key features similar to those of muscle-based skills. The goal is to achieve the key features, not specify all the details. Thus, it will be negotiable. Much is still missing or unknown. Much basic science remains to be done. So the bottom line is, in terms of these really reliable communication control BCIs for really important purposes, we have a long way to go. So the second application is to improve impaired muscle-based skills. The goal of rehabilitation, as we can see it now, is to enable the damaged muscle-based hexers after a stroke or after a spinal cord injury to restore their key features and reestablish a negotiated equilibrium in which each hexer can once again produce its skill satisfactorily. 
So there's a lot of promise, obviously, that's come about in the last 50 years. We now know that the CNS can change in many ways through life. There are many possibilities for restoring function. But there's also a huge problem that comes along with that. There's many kinds of plasticity, and there are many locations of plasticity. Each has its own local mechanism, requirements, and rate. This, it's controlled indirectly or not at all by its impact on behavior. There's no overall direction. There's no little person in the head who can say after damage has occurred, oh, well, we need to do this first, and then we need a little of this, and then, yeah, we want this, and we don't want that. There's, not, as, there's no entity that's going to do that. When damage occurs, therefore, there's no guarantee of optimal plasticity. The system can very well, and it probably usually does, get stuck in a local minimum. Potentially beneficial mechanisms are simply not engaged. So in rehabilitation up to the present, the mainstay really has been skill-specific practice. You practice reach and grasp. You practice locomotion. You practice speaking if these been, have been impaired. These skills, the thing about it is that these skills are very complex. They have many possible mechanisms and sites of plasticity. How do we ensure optimal engagement of the many kinds and sites of potential plasticity? Well, one way is to create a synthetic hexer that targets plasticity to a critical site. The change enables more effective skill-specific practice that promotes negotiation that leads to much wider beneficial plasticity. And that's beginning to be demonstrated. So this is the basic idea. Here we have a hexer, say the hexer for reach and grasp. You have a stroke, it's damaged. You're no longer able to control your arm and hand properly. A synthetic hexer can change a critical site. Perhaps it's a, a reflex that is, has a major impact in producing a flexion synergy after a stroke like this. If you can go in and force a change by directly focusing on it, a synthetic hexer that has one key feature, change in that one, pro, in that one site, you can lead to much wider change that leads to benef wider beneficial plasticity that produces recovery. And that's beginning to happen in, in the laboratories in a number of situations. One thing that, that we began looking at now some years ago, and this is Dennis McFarland's work, this is an example of how you could use EEG sensory motor rhythms. EEG sensory motor rhythms, as we all know, decrease prior to movement. Dennis McFarland showed that if you teach people, these are healthy people, to increase that decrease, to, to do greater desynchronization, the movement time gets faster and error gets better, gets less. So you improve performance by focusing on this feature and increasing this feature, augmenting the desynchronization that normally increases prior to movement. More recently, Donatella Matea's group in Rome has done in a, control, a controlled study, showed that this could improve recovery in people with strokes. So here you see a person who's looking at a virtual hand, and he's learning to use, to decrease EEG sensory motor rhythms to produce flexion, to close, to produce reach, grasp with this hand, to close this hand. To improve and to crawl, close the virtual hand. The virtual hand is closed by the increased desynchronization. And as a result of that training, which supplements normal practice, there's increased control over sensory motor rhythms. And this leads to improved recovery. Here, measured with various measures, this is the Fugelmeyer. But he, the improvement is much greater when this is added to the regular skill specific practice. So this is BCIs in this way could affect stroke recovery, spinal cord injury recovery, a wide variety of disorders that affect millions of people. And the thing is, all it had, this doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to add value. It doesn't have to be a 99.999% reliable. It has to add value. And there are many millions of people throughout the world who could benefit. So this is a really exciting and in the immediate future and probably medium term future, the most impactful application of brain computer interfaces. So the third 
The third application of synthetic hexers is to emulate muscle-based skills for basic science. Really, for two, it has two advantages. First, it avoids all the, the mess of the musculoskeletal complications you do when you, when you, do, when you have, when you have muscle-based skills. I mean, these are things that if you're really interested in exactly what's happening in the central nervous system, there you have it makes things much more complicated. And second, it's closer to reality. Actually, being able to use cortical neurons in this way is closer to reality than what you might have in an artificial neural network. This is an experiment. This is a now a, a bioarchive article by Aaron Batista's group, and they, they're allowing me to present their results. Um, what they've done is record from monkeys about 90 motor cortical neurons in monkeys, and then mapped the neurons to control of a cursor to targets at various places around a screen. So there was an initial, what the basic design is that the monkeys, this is here, the 90 uh, dimensions caused by these 90 neurons are reduced to two neural dimensions here. And this shows the neural activity when the animals learn the first mapping. So this is task, this is the mapping A. They then learn a new mapping, map task B. And then they go back to the original mapping. And the question is, what will they come back to? And they basically consider three possibilities. This again is the situation. Here you have task A going toward the target. The two-dimensional target is reduced to one, this one dimension. And here's the task A1. Here's B, task the map B. This is what happens with map B. So what's going to happen when they go back to task A again? to the original mapping. The first they consider was simply reversion. This just goes away and they go back to doing exactly the same thing that they were doing the first time. Another is that there's simply some drift. It's as good as it was before, but it's not at exactly the same place in this two dimensional space. And the third is that there would essentially be negotiation, that this would be to some extent a compromise between this and this. It would be affected by the change by the map B that had been created. So what happens? What happens is they got negotiation. This is where task B was. You can see this is for one of the neurons, the, the tuning curve for one of the neurons, target direction versus spikes per second. This is during task A. This is during task B. And this is during task A2, when they go back to A2. So there's a definite difference here in the preferred direction for the neuron before and after. And this is the most really graphic determination of the, of the results, that this is really the results of a negotiation. This is the same target, the animal going toward it during task A1 and during task A2, the same mapping, in both cases, they go through it quite effectively. Then they used an offline analysis. They took these same data and they applied map B. So this is when they applied it to task A1. And here you see what would have happened at each point for map B. And generally, there's some that are going in the wrong direction. There are most of many are going almost orthogonal. There really is. It's there's very little similarity here, and it's, there's very ineffective movement toward the, the, this target under task, under task B. Here's what happens when you do it to A2. They line up pretty well. They're pointed back. Map B is now doing pretty well at moving toward the target, even though this was done with the task, with the results of task A2. This is the results of negotiation. So this is the use, this is a scientific use of a BCI to emulate normal practice. There's a whole lot of stuff that can be done and looked at in this way 
to look at normal behavior, normal skill development. So in summary, BCIs enable people to acquire non-muscular skills. There's got, this can, therefore, it can be guided from our new understanding of muscle-based skills. We now understand that muscles, that muscle-based skills are produced by distributed networks of neurons and synapses that change to maintain the skill. This is called a hexer. Hexers share neurons and synapses. They're continually adjusting to each other. They produce a negotiated equilibrium that allows them all to function appropriately. A BCI cre creates a synthetic hexer, a distributed network of neurons and synapses, plus adaptive software. Network and software combine to produce a non-muscular skill and change is needed to maintain the key features of the skill. Synthetic hexers for, are, for communication control are of limited value for now. There's a lot of basic science that needs to be done. Synthetic hexers for rehabilitation are potentially valuable even now. And synthetic hexers for basic science can give important insights. So these are people of NCAN. This I wanna mention again, Dennis McFarland, our support. Thank you, and I welcome your questions and comments. So this, uh, uh, the last experiment that you showed us about uh, learning one task and then uh, a second and then going back to the first task and seeing that you move to a new place in the space reminds me of the spacing effect in memory. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn uh, a, say, a, 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 some kind of a task where you have to remember a list, uh, <clears throat> You're, you can retain it much longer if you spend a little time studying it, but space it mm -hmm. rather than massing all of mm -hmm. it at the same time. Uh, it, it, and we, we tried this on our neural networks in the 80s. That is to say, we, 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 we taught a, uh, a, you know, a task, and then we actually were, uh, what we did was we, we tried to give it some new items in the task. And it, it moved to a new part of the space where it got the new items perfectly. But then if you went back to the old items, it wasn't as good, so you train it again there. And if you keep going back and forth, you can get to a place where it knows all the items. Mm -hmm. It's a different different where you started from the first set, and also different from the, the place where you went with the second set. But you didn't have to space, you had to go back and forth suggesting that you're using the same network in our case. Uh, but you have to be able to uh, go back and forth to negotiate to get to a place where uh, both tasks be done properly. Mm -hmm. It's different from either of the two. Yes, yes. So I mean, it's, memory may not be that different from. <laughs> well, I mean, there are a couple of things. Yeah, um, the 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 fact that what I get from the spacing, the fact that you learn something better, you do a thousand trials. If you space them out, you learn better. Is that there are events occurring between that. That it isn't like you do 100 trials and then it just, okay, forget, you know, just does nothing until you do the next 100 trials. There's going, there basically is negotiation, there's interaction going on in between. And that is to some extent strengthening. I mean, I would call this negotiation because you can explain things like the simple situation they had here by talking about, oh, well, the, this, by talking about this in terms of memory. But when you think about all the things that have to, that, that the normal changes that are necessary, that the, the skills that we have don't just have to adjust to new skills and to make adjustments in themselves as they go along, they have to adjust to growth and aging, they have to adjust to disease and injury. Um, they're basically adjusting all the time. And if every time, you basically generate, uh, I'm also talking about how, this also relates to how they're, they're thinking about interpreting their results in bioarchive, that um, you wind up in just, you wind up generating more and more memories. I mean, it essentially becomes sort of like the epicycles in Ptolemaic astronomy. 
you know, you generate a new circle each time. Oh, well, now I, the planet moved a little differently, so we need a new circle. Yeah, you can cover it, but you wind up doing that. And when you think in terms of the uh, a simple situation, yes, you, you can look at that quite clearly as, as a passive memory. But I think, and this actually relates to the question that I, I mean, I'm not going to ask for answers now, but I wanted to throw it out here because it seems like the best place to, to ask this question. The question I was asking uh, Aaron Batista at the time uh, that I received Scott's invitation. So this was very serendipitous. It seems to me that I, I know very little about neural networks, but I do know about the stability plasticity dilemma, which is still a problem. And I think that the concept of hexers as active agents that are and, and and the negotiated equilibrium they produce, and also key features as opposed to exact details. Basically, the plasticity of the hexers produces the stability of the overall performance of the negotiated equilibrium. And that you could, could you produce a basically input a hexer, several hexers inside a neural network and see how that hexer would then react and then would maintain its performance. You would need its ability, its outputs would not have to be exactly its outputs, but they would have to come together in the application to produce the same key features. Is that a, I mean, maybe that's been done. Um, I mean, I don't know. Okay, so here's another example. I think it's, I think it's actually closer to your uh, idea, which is that say you learn <clears throat> a foreign language, second language, and you, know, you get to be pretty good at it, but then you don't use it for 10 years, right? So it took you a couple of years to get to the point, but the, you go now 10 years later and you seem to be back to where you started. I mean, in other words, uh, you, you've forgotten a lot of words. You can't, you're not fluent anymore, but relearning is much quicker. Yes, yes. And, and, I, and, 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 and suggesting that there was something that was retained, but not in its original form. Yes, and I mean, there are language studies too, which I use in the paper as examples, because if you look at people who are monolingual versus people who are bilingual, and you look at how the MRI associated with how they speak their original language, for people who are bilingual, it's much more complicated because clearly there have been adjustments, additions, additional specifications that were needed to allow the acquisition of the second language. Words that sounded the same, but meant differently, meant the same, but sounded differently, different pronunciations, all those things. So yes, um, you know, or like people say, riding a bike, you can always do that again reasonably well, but that's another reason to believe that hexers re remain active all the time. I mean, all these things are testable. I mean, I have, there's indirect evidence for it at this point, but all these things could be tested. They're not just, you know, ideas to say, well, it's a good idea. Um, but yes, and I think you will, I, anyway, I'd like to discuss more about whether you think it's possible, whether it's worthwhile to even try this in the neural network. Just to, oh, here it is. Yeah, so John, I'd like your comment on the finding that Arno and I made on your data. Oh, <laughs> It was back almost 20 years ago, and we got data from your uh, daily lunchtime sessions of two stalwart volunteers who played a uh, kind of a pong game uh, with their BCI, with their brainwaves at lunchtime for a whole year or so. So the session 208 and session 209 and session. And- uh, Boy, I didn't know about that. <laughs> And they were being rewarded for uh, decreasing in, or increasing their sensory motor rhythm. I think the difference between the left and right mm -hmm. power in the sense in the in uh, electrodes uh, channels uh, with a common some common reference at at C three and C four, which is sort of over the you know, right. somatomotor cortex, and they were. Uh, they were, uh, they had gotten very good at it. They didn't have to think about it, according to them, when I asked them, which, which was quite impressive. Right? And so um, Arno and I decomposed the data and uh, you know, we have our ICA method of finding the effective sources that seem to dominate the signals. And uh, 
and some to the recorded EEG. And we found, we found effective sources of in or near sensory motor cortex that were certainly adapted to uh, and, and powerfully adapted to produce the same the, the result. But there are other there are other influences we found that it were were different where they were either trying to increase their rhythms and make the, the puck go up or decrease and make the puck go down. And uh, so it seemed to be a complicated mixture of things that they were doing to actually, uh, mm -hmm. and they weren't symmetrically opposite. There were different network involved in raising it and, and decreasing it. And, uh, and we wrote a little paper about that. And then you, you challenged us to say, well, what about looking at the channel level? And although, you know, I know I'm not much interested in the channel level because the channels are, are some, activity right. as I showed earlier today all over the cortex. Um, but we did. And guess what we saw? And if you looked at the <laughs> power in those frequencies, that the power difference between up good successful up trials and down trials, it was focused exactly on that channel. Mm -hmm. Even though the sources were projecting more much more broadly. Mm -hmm. So what the brain had learned to do was uh, they learned to the test. Yes. The test was to change power at that signal. So they learned a, a network of source activities that would focus on that signal and probably phase relationships between them to actually give you exactly what you ask, precisely what you're asking for, that this spot on the scalp should, uh, should increase its power or decrease its power. Yes, and yes. Uh, I, when you in your talk, I've been thinking thinking about oh, that, I, I, realizing that I'm very uh, relieved at what you said because when you said that, I was I was afraid you were going to say we found out it was all muscle activity. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't have Dennis to refute that anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, but but it, it seems to me that there's a, a strong connection to what you are talking about here. That they that yes. these extensive network across cortex and and of course in, in subcortex yeah that's what we asked it to do and it, it did that and well there we have examples in rats where we didn't really think clearly about what we were asking where the animal did what we rewarded on which wasn't exactly what we wanted it to do I mean, really very interesting results but yeah you get the system it's a behavior that's what the central nervous system does it behaves it produces adaptive behaviors. And then, yes. Sorry, I'm just curious, what was the reward that um, that motivated uh, the players in your experiment? Well, it was, it was John's experiment and the reward I think was a beep. <laughs> oh, for, <laughs> oh, for which of the, the BCI or for? For the BCI. Yeah. yeah, for this they were playing a pong game. So, yeah, they had to they had to just return it. You know, they had to get to the place and return the ball, basically. Yeah, they they, they didn't get extra pay for for this. Yeah. this was a in fact, pay. in fact, well, the same thing was true. Niels Beerbomber found the same thing, but both in the H reflex training as well as in the PCI training, we would sometimes try to offer people extra money for better performance, and we never gave away a dollar. I mean, it was very interesting. I mean, it was too much incentive. Um, it isn't clear, but it, it Maybe was not, not a, enough. What about a thousand dollars? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So there, there's a paper that came out in Neuron just a few weeks ago uh, that started with an organoid. An organoid is uh, a a you start with a pluripotent stem cell, and then it starts dividing into different types of cells, differentiating. And if you give it the right medium and so forth, it looks like something that uh, has cortical structure, but it's obviously not a cortex. It doesn't have any inputs. But this group stimulated and uh, then was re had a readout, so it had an input and an output that was uh, a, a, a Adjusted and then they trained it to pay, play pong. 
In other words, uh, they gave some kind of reward and they had a learning algorithm. And, and you know, under, it, was, it was probably, you know, out of thousands of cells, maybe hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many, how, it, it was a substantial piece of uh, tissue. But very, uh, very different in terms of its. Uh, didn't have blood vessels, didn't have glial cells, and so it wasn't. It wasn't a real brain, but it was plastic, and and you know it was it mastered uh, this uh, game that was uh, something that you know people play, still organized. I mean, you know, so it, <laughs> yes, so maybe maybe it is. You know, this is a, a miniature version of what you're talking about. Yes, yeah, yes. Um, but yeah, it's taken, it's it's taken inordinately long, I think, to focus, to realize that we need to focus on the behavior. And um, I think neuroscience has basically suffered from the fact that unlike every other science, we're inside the phenomenon. We think we know something, we don't know anything. You know, we really don't have no idea what's actually happened. And I think it's obstructed our understanding. Yes, Robert. Very interesting. Um, so, so you're describing that if you have two hexors and a third hexor is added to it, that the, the two basically have to make place for the third hexor to 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 start uh, like collaborating on the on the on the on the three functions that are implemented by them. Yeah, and I think there has to. I mean, there are a whole lot of pieces of this that that I don't know. Clearly, I mean, when you think about this, the way I'm describing it, these hexers are existing in a very active, very plastic, really very difficult environment, and they're maintaining themselves and they're maintaining their key features. The key okay. features themselves are. It's easy to think of key features of symmetry, but but how other kinds would be maintained, it isn't clear. But clearly, there has to be some. They have to. There has to be some reward. There has to be some energy that keeps them as operating as a network, and and focused on their key features. But so it, it isn't just that they're being. They sort of have to accept this third one. The third one really is is basically pushing its way in, and they respond. And they adapt to it. Um, you can look at this also, and again, I'm certainly no expert in game theory, but you can look at this in terms of them playing a game. It's not a completely hostile game because they all have to get along and they're all part of this organism. So can I tap into the, also the getting along? Because Pardon? Can I tap into this that they have to get along? So, yes, they have so, to get along. Yes. So why are they not competitive? Why why are they, they not trying to get each other like trying to push each other out of the game? Well, right, exactly. But the point, presumably they have to, I, I don't know, but they, they have to get along for the their overall good, for the overall good of the organism. But what keeps them from, from doing that, from pushing, you know, pushing the others out? I don't know. But there is the concept which wasn't going to get into, but there are clearly pathological hexers when you think in that way. An addiction is a pathological hexer that basically takes over. And if we think of it that way, we can, and if we begin to understand the, the networks that underlie addiction, which we're normally beginning to understand, we are beginning to understand, then we can think of approaches in that regard to either to weaken them or to bring them back into the fold. But in, when you think about using these concepts for therapy, that's one of the things that come up. Clearly there are hexers that don't play nice with others. So do, do you think that the, that the mechanism is needed to maintain this overall uh, wellness of the system? So that there's like an overarching like homunculus needed to orchestrate these hexors? Not necessarily to orchestrate, but you're, you're getting something I'm not really ready to talk about yet, but if you, if you think about when I talked about memory and what these hexers were like, how we're talking about procedural memory. Um, I wasn't talking at all about episodic memory, um, which there is also a hexer related explanation for, which I'm not ready to, I mean, I, I just had it for about two years and I'm not really ready to talk about it, but 
it gets to that issue that you're talking about very clearly. Um, because this basically goes back, it basically goes back about 200 years to the foundation of neuroscience. And up to 200 years ago, we, we thought that the, 200 years ago, we thought that the brain, there was, the, there was finally a decision made as to what the brain does. Before that, it was thought to be the interface with the, the immortal soul. And then people started to think about its interaction with the, with the body, you know, um, reflexes and other things, gastrointestinal reflexes, everything else. And we've come to focus pretty much entirely on that. And we no longer talk about interactions with the immortal soul. But basically, when, when we did that, it's been very effective. And we've had a lot of progress as we focus just on those interactions. But when we did that, we, we lost that overall oversight you're talking about. Um, so this relates to getting that back, but um, not as an immortal soul or anything like that, but it re relates to getting that back. Look, look, look forward to your future ideas. Yes, yes. Very interesting yes. talk. So um, we need a connection between the hexers and memory with the um, stability plasticity dilemma, right? And how uh, this negotiation process is a means for retaining, right? Like this, um, avoiding catastrophic forgetting, if you want, right? And right. so in um, for memory, right? So hippocampus plays a central role as an orchestrator of all this negotiation mm -hmm. process, right? The centralized. Uh, uh, um, I mean, something that, that, that coordinates. And so, so what would uh, be an equivalent coordinator uh, in this negotiation process for the hexers? Well, for the hexers at this point, um, I don't really, I mean, I don't know the answer to that. And um, in the healthy nervous system, clearly it happens, but it happens better for some people and in different, if different ways for all of us. You know, we all reach different solutions. And um, for some of them, the, you know, the solutions are at least to appearances less successful in some cases than others. But we all, for the healthy nervous system, we all reached solutions to this. They, they achieve an, a, an acceptable negotiation. Um, why? why it basically usually happens, what role um, it not happening well has in things like depression and other disorders. Um, I don't know, these are, I, mean, I just don't know the answers to these questions. So there's no central arbiter in this negotiation process? This, um... In the negotiation process, I, I haven't thought about whether there's a central arbiter. And even in terms of this other thing we talked about, I don't know its relation to the control of the individuals. There are just a lot of unknowns, but again, there are a lot of experiments that can, things like um, muscle synergies that were mentioned earlier, I think those are results of negotiations among hexers. That again is testable because you could produce a new hexer that interfered with a given synergy, that basically broke up a given synergy. What would happen? There would be changes. You would have old synergies have to change. You could see this happen, and it's possible there are EEG, Scott probably knows this or will know better than, than I do, there are EEG markers of synergies now that have been identified that Prout has looked at. Um, you could potentially use those to look at these, these interactions, these changes actually occurring. I mean, all these ideas, they're all testable. Thank you. Yeah. Very much. A wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was so. a wonderful. Oh. Sorry. Yes. No, it's okay. It's just water.
Yeah. Which I, I run off, but I'll tell you. The excerpts Estonia of our line, really that support our lines of scientific example. thinking have been yes. lucid so about the yes. challenge yes. Yes. to negotiate yes. with new ideas. Yeah, Paulus also potentially, though I go back. So and now we have a, a, a yeah. Arno, you no, you make your house But I, yeah, I'd be interested in. Uh, well, about, then we yeah. have the reception, oh, so you're invited outside, and then also we have the poster session. I mean, you brought the poster, all that you go hang it in the mobi lab, so you see the sign mobi lab, basically and the, the others, you're free to go inside the mobi lab and see the posters and comment on them. And um, yes, yeah, so to hang the poster is just clips, so that's, you know, you just clip your poster, it's very I mean, easy. Please, please. Yes, like a basal ganglion. Sequences of actions come out of the interaction.